Well, good morning. My name is Zach. Welcome to my home. Um, I, I'm so grateful you joined us today. I'm the pastor at the Mission Church. Um, and wow, we are just smack dab in the middle of an unprecedented season. How many times have you heard that word unprecedented? It's probably getting annoying to you. I don't know how you feel, but probably for the first time in this whole process, I finally came to this moment, it was really last week starting on Sunday, where I just, I became very weary of, and, and fed up, if, I mean, that's more of a blunt way of putting it, of, of this season. I, I just, I don't know if you feel this way, but there's a sense in which I feel like we, we don't even see the light at the end of the tunnel. There's a sense in which, gosh, I'm weary from just, having to stay and not being able to see other people. I think really the heart of my weariness more than anything is that I miss you guys. I miss seeing you all on Sunday morning. I miss having conversations with you. And um, I know that God is using this for good. I know that he's using this for your good. I know that God is teaching each and every one of us um, a lot of really important things, and I'm praying that you would have ears to hear what God is teaching you, but I just want to say I, I miss you dearly, and that, that leads me to my just next thing. I really want to connect with you. I really want to hear from you. I want to know how I can pray for you, and so would you please consider um, shooting us a text. You can just text this word, TMC Connect to this number right here, 94000, and it will shoot you a link and you can fill out our online connection card and, and let me know how I can pray for you. If you are, maybe you just started watching online, we've never met before, I wanna connect with you, and again, this is the best way to do it. Just text TMC Connect to this number, 94000. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 12. Today I want to talk to you about purpose. I, I want to talk about finding my purpose, or maybe you might call it finding your purpose. And as you break out your Bible, John chapter 12, verse 12 is where we'll be at. Um, before I read it, I, I want to share just a few very short biographical stories that, that I think will set up our time together. Some of these stories are people I know personally. Some of these stories are um, just inspiring stories I've read. Um, a number of years ago, I read this book. It's called Kisses from Katie. It's about this girl um, who in high school, she went on this mission trip, I think it was to Uganda with her mom, and came back and just really was pretty transformed by that. Um, and the time came for her to graduate from high school and go to college. And, and listen, this is a girl that by our American culture standards, she had it all. Voted prom queen, drove a nice classic uh, chick car is what you might call it. I think it was like the Volkswagen bug. I say that because my wife had one and I even drove it myself. It was yellow. It's not my manliest moment. That's a whole nother story. So here's this girl, kind of has it all. Her parents are about ready to send her um, to this private Christian college. I mean, this girl, she's got Got so many incredible opportunities right before her. and then she feels like God is calling her to instead go to college go to Uganda and teach for a year so she talks to her parents and they say okay you can go for a year and so she goes and she begins to teach there and realizes and her eyes are open to the tremendous needs that are there she begins to find that these kids that she's teaching some of them they don't even have any parents and so what ends up happening over the next year and over the next couple years is she stays. She stays, she starts her own school of her own. She adopts, listen to this, 14 different kids. She goes on and she does a significant amount of other things but she gave up this kind of comfortable American lifestyle and traded it all to adopt 14 kids and teach in a small school and serve that community that was in need. 
I think of another story, this um, a story of a pastor. He wrote a book, this is a number of years ago, he wrote a book that became an international bestseller, translated in all to these different languages, and literally became a multi-millionaire overnight. And here's a guy who lived a pretty simplistic lifestyle, had been driving the same car for eight, nine years, had lived in the same house for a couple of decades. I mean, this guy had, him and his wife and his family, lived a pretty simplistic lifestyle and overnight he becomes a multi multi millionaire and they stop and come to the point and realize what are we gonna do we could upgrade our lifestyle get a new car build a bigger house I mean what could we do and they prayed about it and what they decided to do was to add up all of the money he had earned from his church and the salary he had been paid for the previous 23, 24 years, and he paid it all back to the church and decided to start working for free. He then took the rest of all of this other money that he had, it's still millions of dollars, and started an organization, and the heart of the organization would be to go and plant churches across the world and train and equip some of the poorest of the poor people. And what they decided is, you know what? We have enough. Instead of increasing our lifestyle, we'll serve and raise the bottom lifestyles of others. We'll go and serve by planting churches across the world. And so what they decided is to give away 90% and live on the 10. I think of another story. These next two are people I know. There's a couple at our church. I'm sure many of you know them. They've adopted two children. They're in the process of you know, God willing, adopting their third child, their foster parents. They've fostered a number of different children. I mean, they're just giving their life to this. They're now at the point where the more they get into this, the more opportunities they have. They're now at the point where they're supporting a number of other foster families. They're at the point now where they are literally stepping into empowering other people and equipping other people to become foster parents. They are now also at the place where they are working with other churches to help them start and 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 see a foster care ministry take off and 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 this is not a you know give up a saturday afternoon kind of work this has become their lifestyle i think of another person in our church i was talking to him a number of months ago ever since he was 16 years old he's gone on a mission trip every single year giving up weeks, sometimes two weeks of his vacation time, having to either spend or raise hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars to go on these mission trips. But, but he goes because he feels called and he goes to serve others because he feels called. And what's happened is him and another gentleman in our church um, now have, have started and seen what I would call a gospel movement in Sierra Leone, Africa, where they are, they have seen hundreds of salvations, hundreds of baptisms in Sierra Leone because of this organization, Impact a Life, that they have started and, and seen move forward. They've started a Christian school that, that is growing and flourishing. They've planted churches. I mean, like I said, a gospel movement. And again, this is not like a Saturday afternoon they pour themselves into this. This has become a lifestyle for them. This has become a, a heart of generosity for them. I, I, I tell these four stories for a reason. They all have something in common. In fact, all of them have three things in common. The first thing in common is this. All four of these stories come out of a sense of purpose. Every story I told, these people aren't doing these things willy-nilly. They are doing them because there is a tremendous sense of purpose that they have by doing these. The second reason is this. The second thing that that it has in common is this. All four of these stories reveal a radical, a radical sacrificial service for the sake of others that is driven by a love for Jesus. Let me just say that again. All four of these stories tell a story of people who are radically 
sacrificially serving. This is not just like a one-time service thing. This is their lifestyle, a radical sacrificial service for the sake of others that's driven by a love for Jesus. They're doing this because they love Jesus and they want to follow Jesus. And here is the third thing that I hope these all have in common. When you hear these stories, what happens to the inside of you? When you hear these stories, I wonder if what happens inside of you is you begin to light up. There's something inside of you that, 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 that even though you realize, man, these are really radical people, there's something inside of you that, that goes, ah, oh, but there's something right about this too. There's something about what they're doing that makes me kind of want to do more also, right? I mean, it, it, doesn't these story inspire you to take, take another step into this realm of purpose? And I share these stories because the passage we're about ready to look at, it has to do with purpose. And, and it has to do with the radical purpose God has given each and every one of us. And if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at John 12, and it teaches us three things. Three things we're going to look at. It teaches us the culture's purpose, Jesus' purpose, and your purpose. So John 12, let's read it together. It says, The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So imagine a crowd. This is probably a crowd of thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people. They're clamoring around Jesus. And it says they took palm branches... Um, branches of palm trees and went out to meet him crying Hosanna blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord even listen to this the king of Israel don't miss that they are literally proclaiming Jesus to be the political king of Israel that's a big deal this is like you having a massive parade with thousands of people and you're going out and saying this is the new president or this is the new governor this is you, you they are trying to make him the king of Israel. And it says, And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. So everyone is, is clamoring, this is the king of Israel. Other people are saying, not only is he the king of Israel, but man, I heard and I saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus is amazing. Let's make him our king. And listen to what happens next. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew went and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Let's make sure this picture is painted vividly clear. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. Everyone is shouting, this is the king of Israel. This is the king of Israel. People are placing on Jesus an identity and a purpose of power, of prestige, of popularity. And even the Pharisees see it. And the Pharisees are going, oh my goodness, he, he, he's taking over the world. So I want you to see that here. This is a big, big deal. And what happens next is it says there's these Greeks so these are people who don't even live in Israel. These are people who have traveled hundreds of miles to see Jesus. And it says that they come to Philip and they say, Hey, Philip, we wish to see Jesus. People from a different country have come. 
because they've heard of the popularity of Jesus and they come to Philip and say, man, we got to see this Jesus. He must be something. He's amazing. He's incredible. He's awesome. And everybody is around saying, Jesus, Jesus. Everybody is around saying, make Jesus king, make Jesus king. And I want you to see that Philip is buying into the hype. He is so excited about the power, prestige, and popularity that is being placed on Jesus that when the Greeks come to him and say, hey, we want to see this awesome Jesus, Philip doesn't go to Jesus. Philip goes to Andrew first. And you better believe that Philip came to Andrew and said, man, you're not going to believe it. The popularity of Jesus is spread. It's spread into different parts of the world. There's these guys, they've come all the way from Greece. I mean, they're way out there and they have come and they want to go and see Jesus. This is incredible. And, and listen to this. The reason why Philip and Andrew are so pumped and excited is this. If Jesus is made the political king of Israel, that would make Philip and Andrew and the rest of the disciples princes. That would make them extraordinarily powerful. What we see here in this passage is this. It is a picture of the culture's purpose for your life and how easy it is to buy into it. Isn't this what the culture teaches us about what our purpose is? Doesn't our culture teach us that our purpose ought to be about being bigger, being better? Don't we live in a culture that teaches us, that says your purpose, it should be power, it should be prestige, it should be popularity. You should have more followers on Facebook or Instagram. Your purpose, it should be rags to riches. It should be obscurity to popularity. It should be climate I mean the corporate ladder. It should be powerless to powerful. The purpose of your life, the culture says, is this. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Doesn't it? It says that. And it's easy for us to be like Philip and Andrew to go, yeah, that does sound nice to make my purpose to become real rich. That does sound nice to make my purpose to really climb that corporate ladder. Now let's be really, really clear here. There's something inside all of us that is probably saying this, well, what's wrong with being rich? What's wrong with climbing the corporate ladder? What's wrong with having a position of power or authority or influence? What's so wrong with that? And here's the truth, nothing. Never once will you see Jesus condemn a rich man for being rich. Never once will you see Jesus condemning a man of authority for having authority. Jesus never con condemns these kind of people, but what he condemns and what he calls out is when these people make it their purpose. It's when these people take their riches and build their kingdom instead of God's kingdom. Take their power and elevate themselves rather than serving others. This is the culture's purpose for your life. Your kingdom come, your will be done. But I'm here to tell you it is an empty purpose. And that's exactly what Jesus does next. He calls out this purpose so they come Philip and Andrew come to Jesus and they're like, Jesus, this is amazing. Listen to what they're hearing. Listen to the chance that they're giving you all this power. You're going to be king. This is awesome. And listen to what Jesus says. Jesus answered them, guys, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus will do this often, where people will come to him with an agenda they want him to pick up. And the disciples come to him with this agenda of Jesus, man, we could really take this power to a whole new level. And Jesus stops them right in their tracks and says, that's not my purpose. Here's my purpose right here. He says the hour, every time that Jesus refers to the hour, he does this a ton of times in the Gospel of John, but every time he does, he's actually talking about his death. 
He says, guys, I did not come to be the political king of Israel. I did not come to gain power and prestige. I came to die. And he even gives this metaphor. He says, listen, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it will remain alone. It will remain alone and it will remain useless. But listen, if a grain of wheat is buried into the ground, it will die and then it will bear much fruit. Let me give you an example of what Jesus is saying right here. I don't know if you can see this. This is a cashew. Actually found, I was in Sierra Leone, Africa in October, and they had several bags of these cashews. And I picked one up and I said, hey, what do you guys use these for? And I assume they said, well, we use to eat them. And of course they do. But what they use these for more than anything is they use these to plant. Now, this is a single cashew. I could crack it open and I could eat it, and I don't know how good it would be or not, but I'm sure if it was fresh enough, it would be good. Or what I could do is I could bury this into the ground, and what will happen is if I bury this into the ground, it will begin to rot and it will die. This will die, but once it dies, it will sprout and become a tree. Cashew trees can grow up beyond 40 feet in height. And literally what can happen is if I choose to not eat this and serve myself and instead put it into the ground and let it die, it can bear fruit and bear fruit hundreds of thousands of fold. It could bear hundreds of thousands of these over the next several decades. And Jesus says this, my purpose is not become to be the political king. My purpose is not to become this powerful, prestigious person. My purpose has come to die so that others might live. Jesus puts it this way a few verses later. He says, now my soul it's troubled. And, and what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? Should I say, Father, save me from dying? He says, no, for this purpose I have come to this hour. What is Jesus saying? He says, guys, my purpose is not power, prestige, popularity. My purpose is to die so that others might live. Matthew 20 says this, Jesus says this, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The culture's purpose says, further yourself. Jesus says, my purpose is to die so that others might live. And then what Jesus does next, back in verse 25 and verse 26, is he begins to define your purpose. And what I want you to see is that Jesus' death for your salvation becomes the way you ought to live and imitate. Jesus' purpose becomes your purpose. Listen to what he says. This is in John chapter 12, verse 25 here, I lost my slides. Oh, there they are. Um, you're not going to be able to see it for some reason, so I'll just read it here. Jesus says, Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I, you need to listen to that. You need to hear that. Listen to what he says. Whoever loves his life will lose it. What, what does he mean by that? To love your life is to, is to serve yourself. It's to look to yourself. It's to look to your wants. It's to look to your desire, desires. It's to serve yourself. And isn't this what the culture says? Don't we live in a culture that says, if you want to find your purpose, don't look to God, look to yourself. If you want to see your purpose in life, don't look to others, look within yourself. And, and do what you feel is best. Do what you feel is right. Be true to yourself. Look to yourself to find your purpose. That's what our culture says. And Jesus says, if you look to yourself to find your purpose, you'll lose your life. You'll feel so lost. Do you know why you will, find, you will feel so lost if you look to yourself for your purpose? Is because God 
created you for bigger things than yourself. Rick Warren, he says this in his book, Purpose Driven Life. He says, you were created by God and you were created for God. And until you understand that, a lot of things in life are not going to make any sense at all. And so Jesus says, you want to find your purpose? Don't look to yourself. He says, you must hate your life. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And listen, Jesus isn't calling us to self-hatred. That's not what he means by saying hate your life. What he is saying is, you want to find your purpose in life? Don't look to yourself. Look to Jesus. Hate your life. In other words, surrender your life to Jesus. And what you will find is eternal life. What you will find is the purpose to your life. You know what the purpose of your life is? The purpose of your life is to joyfully surrender yourself to Jesus and say, my life is yours. In verse 26, Jesus takes it a little bit further. He goes beyond saying the purpose of your life is to surrender your life to Jesus. Listen to what he says. This is verse 26. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Listen to this one more time. I need to read it. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. We should go, wait a second, Jesus, follow you where? If the purpose of my life is to surrender my life to you, and if the purpose of my life is to follow you, follow you where? Well, where is Jesus going? He's going to the cross. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. He must follow me to the cross. And he must be my servant. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So to put it very, very clearly, the purpose of your life is to joyfully surrender to Jesus and to follow him by sacrificially serving others. That's the purpose of Jesus's life. That's the purpose of your life. Let me just say it one more time because you need to get this. The purpose of your life is to joyfully surrender to Jesus and to sacrificially serve others. To follow Jesus by sacrificially serving others. That's your purpose. Ephesians 2.10 puts it this way, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Jesus is telling us right here, you were made by God and for God. You were made not to build your kingdom, but to build his kingdom. You were made for something far more glorious than your own glory. You were made for God's glory. You were created created for good works. And if you fight that, and if you deny that, man, you're going to feel lost. So let me just say it one more time. Let me put it up here. Your purpose is to joyfully surrender your life to Jesus and to follow him by sacrificially serving others. That's your purpose. Let me say three very quick observations about this. Observation number one, this is radical, okay? This is radical. To joyfully surrender my life to Jesus? Well, what about my life, Jesus? What about what I want? What about what I desire? What about, what about me? What about me? Isn't there a sense in which we do that? Well, what about me, Jesus? What about you? I know that's hard to hear, this is radical. I don't want to deny that. Let's not try and let, let's not try and take Jesus' words about, about, 
about dying to ourselves and about hating our life in this world so we can have eternal life. Let's not take Jesus' radical words and put them in some language that kind of softens it up. Don't do that. What Jesus is calling us to, it is radical. He is calling you not to just sacrifice a segment of your life, but to sacrifice your whole life, to take all of your money, to take all of your time, to take all of your talents, to take all of yourself and to put them at the foot of Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, your kingdom come, not my will be done. Okay, your kingdom come. You do what you want to do here. Now, this doesn't mean that we go and give away every single cent that we have, but it does mean that we use our money a heck of a lot differently than the world does. The purpose of your life, it is radical by the world's standards. Let's just not deny that. It is radical. The other thing I want you to see about the purpose of your life is that this is foundational, not specific. Here's what I mean by that. I told you about some stories at the beginning of the sermon. I talked to, to you uh, about this couple in our church that does foster care and adopts Listen, that flows from this foundational purpose, but what they do comes out of a specific calling they have. You might not be called to foster care. You might not be called to adopt children, but you might be called to make a lot of money and give a ton of it away for gospel purposes. You might be called not to necessarily give tons of money away because you don't have a tons of money, but you might be called to serve in a homeless shelter. You might be called to, I don't know, you, you, you got to think about it. you got to pray about it. you got to discern it. This is foundational. You need to clarify, God, what is the specific calling you have for my life? And here's the third thing. This is hard. This is really, really hard. This is really, really hard. And I'll end by saying this. This is hard. But if you do it, you will find two things. Jesus is worthy, and this is worth it. I used to follow Jesus more out of an act of duty than a joyful delight. I, if I'm honest, I, that, that, I followed Jesus more out of duty. Jesus, you died for my sins. Gosh, I guess I owe it to you to, to follow you and to serve you and to serve others. And then by the grace of God, it was like a switch went off in my life and I became overwhelmed by the gospel. I became overwhelmed with, I'm just going to call it a love for Jesus. I love Jesus more than anything in the whole entire world. Do you know why I serve Jesus? Do you know why I do some of the things that I do? Do you want to know why I want to passionately pour out my life for this purpose? Is because Jesus is worthy. I don't do any of this out of an act of obligation, nor do I do it perfectly. But I do this because I love Jesus with all of my heart. And you need to ask yourself a question. Do you follow Jesus out of duty or do you follow Jesus out of delight? And I'll be honest, sometimes it starts with discipline to follow Jesus. But don't get trapped in following Jesus out of duty. If you do, I'm telling you, you don't get the gospel. And you need to spend some time on your knees gazing at the worthiness of Jesus. And then here's the second reason why you should do this. It's worth it. It's worth it. Go back to John 12, 25 and 26. Jesus says, if you do this, you will have eternal life. If you do this, you will have the presence of the Father with you. And if you do this, you will bear much fruit. Let me end with this. This is a um, quote that has become a mantra in my life. C.T. Studd, who was a missionary, said this. He said this, Only one life twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And I want to live that way. It may cost me everything 
to live radically for Jesus. But I found that it's worth it. And I want to live a life that matters. So as we go, and you'll find these questions, and it's not coming up on the screen. I wish it was. I'm having technical difficulties. There's three questions that should be up here. You can find them in the worship guide. So go and get the worship guide. Here's the three questions I want you to pray through and talk through. What purpose do you feel like you are living for right now? Why do you follow Jesus? And lastly, what specific unique ways is God calling you to sacrificially serve others? Go and pull out the worship guide and talk about those and pray about those. And let's live the radical life that Jesus called us to. And when we do, people will see the love and life of Jesus in you. Let me pray. Father, would you bless this time of worship we're about ready to enter into? And even though you call us to a radical life of sacrificially serving you, remind us you are worthy and it is worth it. Amen. God bless you.